So after <coughs> giving uh, some introduction about this letter, about, for example, who John is, the spiritual condition of the church, the false prophets which were bringing false teaching into the church. Although there is much more to say, um, but today we will start studying um, the first chapter. Um, we remind ourselves that the theme that we will be looking through this book is having fellowship with the Father and the Son. This is an important um, way of how we can understand why John wrote this letter. One can notice even how this chapter ends and this, the second chapter begins. We can realize how important it is for us to realize that in order that we have fellowship with God and as he desires to have fellowship with us, um, we cannot live in habitual sin. And we will come to that later on. Not today. We find as we read John that he has a certain passion to make known the true character, the true, true nature of who Jesus is. We explained during our Bible studies the different doctrines that were coming into the church in the first century, distorting who Jesus is. John is making very clear that unless we know who Jesus is, the one that he himself has seen, the one that he himself has touched, we will not be in the true fellowship, in the genuine fellowship with him and with the Father. I start by reading or referring to some important aspects of how John starts his letter. He starts by saying, that which was from the beginning. Knowing that John already wrote the gospel just a few years before he wrote this letter, the memory of the Christians, the church that's, or churches that are reading this letter will quickly go to the historical facts that John explained in the introduction of the gospel that we call the gospel of John, in the beginning. And here he says, in the beginning, or from the beginning, depends what translation you read. In the beginning was who? The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Then he goes on to describe the work of the Word, historically, at some point in time, the Word created time, created matter, and all that we see around us, and all those things that we don't know about. So when he is saying from the beginning, the idea is that the one that was from the beginning is God himself. He already made it clear in the gospel, and that's why he wrote the first gospel for the same reason, to counteract the false doctrine of who Jesus is. And that's why we find those statements of the I am statements in the uh, Gospel of John. And we find that Jesus was going to be stoned for claiming that he was God. So that's been already settled. And John is going now more than speaking historically. He is now speaking about his own experience. So it was from the beginning, that 
which was. It's not there. It's, it happened. Creation is done. But now, the English translation is much better than the Maltese in this case. But still, it needs a bit of clarification. John is saying, which we have heard. John has a personal experience with Jesus. The way the Greek is written would be, which, he, which we have continually heard. So the time that John spent with Jesus, in the way he is writing, listen, I am writing about what I have continually heard. What I have or we have continually seen with our eyes. What we have continually touched with our hands. This is why he's saying, I am speaking about the Jesus that I know of. The others had no personal experience. But John had a personal experience with Jesus. Not just because of his family connections, which we already seen in the past, in the few weeks ago. But because he spent those three years with him. So he had seen Jesus. Not just going from one town to the other. He had the privilege of seeing Jesus in his glory on a mountain. Together with Moses and Elijah, he has seen his glory. And he has heard his teaching. He's seen his miracles. He touched with Jesus, who is the fullness of God. And that is why the Gospel of John gives us insights that no other gospel gives us and repeats what Jesus said, those who have seen me have seen the Father. This is the word that John is making known to the church because there were people, as we said in the past, who were claiming that it seemed that it was the Messiah. It seemed that Jesus was uh, crucified. Some say Jesus um, was adopted and became the son of God uh, because just God chose him. He was a human being like us and so forth. All these different kind of uh, theologies, which we can still find them around today. And John is making it clear that the one that we're going to believe in, the one that is able to forgive our sin is no one else except the son of God, God himself. So, the incarnation is a real thing. It's very important that our faith speaks about, shows that we truly believe in the real Son of God, in the real God that became man. Why is this important? It is important because the correct understanding on the nature of Christ is our starting point of what we believe about God. Is Jesus he who he said he is? Or is he not? Is he God in the flesh? Or is he not? Because if he is not, then all other kinds of doctrines can come and be formed, and no one can say which one is the truth. But if we believe that Jesus Christ came, Jesus came in the flesh and is the Christ, then we have no other options as believing that Jesus is God in the flesh. John says that what he have heard, seen, and touched, he's saying, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Proclaiming the word of life. Who do we proclaim? 
Remember that Jesus sent us to proclaim his gospel, to preach his gospel, to declare salvation is in him. So the question to us comes, am I proclaiming the one who I believe is able to save a sinner from the fires of hell? Sometimes we forget that this is our main goal as believers, living for the glory of God, and as we live for the glory of God, we are his witnesses. We give witness about who we are and what Jesus has done for us. What John is writing is his experience. We have our own experience. And that experience is our testimony of what Jesus has done in our life from what he saved us. And we can use that and we should use that to proclaim him in this world that we live in. We already established in one of our Bible studies, I think it was, that we live in spiritual darkness. Our world is spiritually dark. And we are the light. The light that God himself shines upon us. We are the light of the world. And we need, not really need, we are supposed to be the natural thing, light. Because light cannot decide and say, I want to become shadow today. Light is light. It will remain there. And as believers, we need to show that light. Proclaim that Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is the way. And he is the life. Because he is the word of life. The way word of life is written does not say that the word has life. It means it is life. The word is life. The word of God is life. We are born again, the Bible says, by the word of God. We are washed by the word of God. It is the word of God that makes us realize who we are in the light of God himself as we see ourselves and as we relate to one another. The word of God. Some of us are very eager to read and study the Word of God. Some of us do it because that's what they're supposed to do as a ritual. And some of us may find it difficult to make time to read and study the Scripture. It shouldn't be that. Because the Word of God is the bread of life. It is the bread of that we need to eat for our spirit to remain living in him. We spoke about, or we read about fellowship. It's another key word that we find in the book, which means participation or partnership or communion, among other words. Here we find that he wants us to be in fellowship with the Son, with the Father, and with one another. What does this mean? What does this fellowship mean? Does it mean that on Sunday morning I go for fellowship for one hour and then go back and forget all about the church. Maybe I come also for Bible study, and so on. That's what some of us may think. Some think that fellowship is when we have the monthly meal, or some barbecue, or whatever. It's more than that. The fellowship 
that Jesus, the scripture is talking about, is the fellowship, the continuous fellowship with God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Which means, my life is in fellowship. The totality of my life is in fellowship with God. Is in fellowship with the body of Christ. We've seen some time ago some people, what they post on Facebook. I love Jesus, but hate the church. These are posts that you see on Facebook. How can you say you love Jesus, but hate the church? The church could have hurt you, but you cannot hate the church because you're in partnership. You're in one with Jesus. We read in the scripture that we are part of one body, the body of Christ. We are that loaf, the piece of that loaf, and the loaf is Jesus. So we cannot say, I love Jesus, but hate the church. And that's why later on we read that you cannot say you love God and hate your brother. If you do that, then it says, you do not know him. And these are serious statements that we will be uh, looking at as we go through the book. One other thing we see which is very important is that this book, John, in his writing, uses a word in the gospel and in his letters and once in Revelation, the word remain. Or, as some other translations, abide. It could be translated dwell or remain. The point of this word is that when the John says or when the scripture is saying, you abide in him, it's a permanent place. And I like to use the analogy of your permanent address. Anyone who has filled the questionnaire, have anyone filled that questionnaire? My goodness. Oh, the, 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 the census. Sorry, it's a questionnaire. The census. Anyhow. But then it comes, you know, do you live permanently in this address? Do you have any other way to live? Christians cannot say, yes, I live in Christ Sunday morning, but then I live in the world the rest of the week. I go to my holiday flat through the week. We cannot say that. Our permanent address is in Jesus. And that's why then John says, you cannot say you love the word, God and you love the word at the same time. If you say that, you are a liar. Now, if I tell you LRA, you might come and hit me. Okay, but you cannot go and hit God. Because the word of God says you are. And this is the reason why we need to take the word of God so seriously. God is God. You cannot play jokes with him. And he makes the rules. Why? Because he's God. We may not agree. But who are you to disagree with God? Can the clay tell the potter what to do? No. And if we are sincere with ourselves, we know that God wants the best for us even if we do not understand it. The best example is parents, Telling tell, tell children, don't touch this, or don't touch that, or just don't run out into the street. Why? They think it's adventure. They think it's nice to trouble their parents and do exactly what contrary to what the parents are saying. Then, ah! Eh? And the same thing, God with us. God knows what's best for us. God knows that heaven is a better place than hell. Do you have any doubt? And that's where we were heading. That's where our place was. That's where 
our meno, our abiding place was before we met with Jesus. John uses this word 68 times. In the whole New Testament, we find it 118 times. And after a long time with calculators and papers, I went on Google and I managed to find the percentage of how many times John used in comparison with the rest of the scripture. And he uses this word to remain in him 58% of the word used in the New Testament, 58% is used by John. Can you imagine his heart where it is that we can have to abide in Christ to be with him, to have our permanent spiritual address in Jesus. This is not just a theme from John. I just mentioned this because we're studying John. Paul is another champion of using another word or phrase in him or in the beloved or in Christ in just one chapter in the book of Ephesians he uses it 10 times so the apostle Paul the apostle John understands the importance that we live we abide in Christ in Christ God lived on earth. Can you imagine living in those days? Can you imagine having the grace of seeing Jesus, touching Jesus, hearing Jesus, experiencing His grace and His mercy? But I have some good news for you. As in God was in Christ while Jesus was on earth, today Jesus is in you. And isn't that good news? It should shake the way we think. It should shake our behavior. It should shake the way we approach this world. When, Jesus, when John spoke about Jesus being the word of God in the gospel of John, in verse 14, then he says, and the word of God lived with us. That word lived is a Greek word which also refers to a tent or tabernacle. Tabernacle is not what most small teas think about where the priest put the host in. Tabernacle is where somebody lives, a tent. The same thing. Jesus came and made his tent among us. Now, Jesus is not making his tent among us. He made you his tent. You are his temple. So although you didn't live in the first century, you still can experience Jesus in your life today. And not only that, you can tell others your, about your experience with Jesus. That's what he expects from us. And that's what we should do. Especially in this dark and depressed generation. John was not interested in writing books about theology. John was interested in writing his experience with Jesus. We can say Paul was interested in theology. He was a theologian. He wrote books like the book of Romans and Galatians. They are purely theologi theologi theological books. But the writings of John are about his experience 
with Jesus. And if we don't have that experience, probably we would not be able to be his witness. And remember, witness does not mean just speaking. It is also sacrificing. The word witness also means martyr. Martyreo is the Greek word, which basically in this context means I'm ready to die as long as I preach Jesus. We can have a picture of this from the book of Acts in chapter 4. We find John and Peter. They were preaching and make, you know, praying for the sick and they were recovering. And you know that lame man who never walked in his life and walked. Hallelujah. What happened to them? They were beaten and thrown into prison. And then when they brought them out, they said, now you don't speak about this name. How can we not speak about the one that we have seen and heard their answer was? How can I stop speaking about who Jesus is? Because they had that experience. And this time, in this age, the church needs the true experience, the genuine experience with Jesus. It will be like those days that we sang about being the time of Ezekiel and of David and so forth. These are the days. They never stopped being these days, but these days are those days. We need to be Preachers of the word of God. Verse 2. The life appeared. So notice... The word of life, and then the life appeared. It's a continuation. Who is the life? Jesus claimed that he is the life. Do you remember that? Huh? Do you remember that? He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. You say, no, it's not written like that. I know. It says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. But that's how it should be read, literally. The emphasis of what Jesus is saying, I am he and no one else is. That's the grammar, Greek grammar there. I am the way to the Father. No one else is. I am the truth of God and no one else is. I am the life eternal life, and no one else is. That's the emphasis of John in the gospel, chapter 14. And that emphasis should be ours as well. We should emphasize that all these philosophies that are trying to change and change our values, our moral values, will not change us. We must not give in. We are here as witnesses of this great God and Savior whom we call Lord Jesus Christ. Paul John said the life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. Do you have an experience with Jesus? If you're born again, you must have one, whatever that might have been. And that's your testimony. Last Tuesday, you know how we are. We, were, we had Bible study and we were all joking, putting each other's legs as, you know, we like to do. And somehow I said, you know, I tell you my testimony. I don't remember why I said that, but I, I know I said it. And someone said, don't let him start that. I've heard it a hundred times. And that's great. And I want to keep sharing my testimony 
not just how I was saved, but how he saved me even from death a couple of years ago. So, that's another great testimony that I have. And that's what Jesus done for me. And it was amazing even when I spoke with doctors. What I experienced through that time when everybody was in panic. I said, this is what I experienced. Now, I'm sure you heard it 100 times. You want to hear it 101 time. It's not because we're already over time, okay? But you know, and that keeps me going. I know that unless God is finished with me, you will not get rid of me. So, let us proclaim our relationship with Jesus. Because it says our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Being one with the Father brings joy to our hearts. The word will try to bring sadness, but the joy of Jesus overcomes that. That's why also John says in his gospel, quoting Jesus, the word will give you troubles and tribulation. Have you noticed? You haven't noticed that? Oh, oh. But Jesus says, but a strong contrast. That word but is trying, there are several words translated but, but this one is make a strong con contrast. But I will give you my peace. His shalom, his well-being. Jesus. So, whom should I have fellowship with? The letter will develop this as we go along. But we all know, even as we're at, what to, where we're at today, God wants us to have fellowship with him and with one another, and then we will all experience that particular joy that nothing in this world can provide. Nothing in this world can offer. It is the peace, the inner peace, that during the battles of life, the great creator is living with you and is in you. God bless you. We'll continue this study, God willing, on Tuesday.